January 30th, exactly one year ago, an announcement sent shockwaves through the financial industry in the Caribbean. CL Financial was insolvent. Today, I'm going to discuss this issue with Mr. Afra Raymond, right here in Trinidad and Tobago, where this all started. He is a charter, a charter surveyor, but he's also a columnist with the Trinidad Guardian newspaper and some body who has kept touch with all that has happened over the year. Raymond, thank you for taking the time out to speak thank you. to us on this edition of Up Next. Thank you. First of all, let me ask you to give us a summary of what led to this situation. In other words, up until January 30th last year, what was the position that you knew, that we found out? Well, that question you're asking, Mr. George, is actually the big mystery. We do not know, as a matter of public information, what caused the collapse. In other words, what was the precedent event that triggered the collapse? We, can, we have heard reports of a particular type of conduct, which we will discuss in this show, which, which led the group to be in a weaker position than it ought to have been in, because it was a conglomerate, a multinational conglomerate, headquartered in the Caribbean, with industries, interest in industries across a range. There was liquor, there was uh, tourism, there was real estate, there was finance, there was insurance, there were various types of investments and so on. The three causes mentioned by the governor of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago when the bailout was announced on the 30th of January last year were excessive related party transactions. What is that? If you just what an excessive related party transaction is, is that these companies, they're a group of companies all owned by the same head company, the parent company called CL Financial Limited, mm -hmm. and those companies were borrowing off each other's balance sheet and lending to each other. To put it simply, if company A was doing very well and was very profitable, company A would borrow a sum of money and lend it to company B. And so far, so good. Nothing is but wrong. But all of them are involved are yes. still CL Financial. Correct. Okay. Nothing is wrong in law with a company A lending money to company B. That sort of thing happens every day in the world of business. What, 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 where the wrongdoing becomes apparent and the problems in terms of running a business is when you look at the terms of the deal. In other words, what is the interest rate that A is charging B? When do they have to repay the money? What happens if B cannot repay A the money? Is there, is there a, an ability for A to actually recover that money from B? And so on. These are the things that you would find in a normal, conventional banking agreement at arm's length, which mm -hmm. is just a phrase we use to describe a negotiation between people who are not particularly close. But when people are very close, it assumes the character that the governor spoke of, which is a related party transaction. And when people are that close that they are related, the commercial and prudent norms can and very often do become distorted. Is incest a good word to describe that? It could be. It could be. It could be used. I might use that word, but you would. It could be a good <laughs> word to describe that sort of thing. And the, and the other factor, of course, so the first factor we went into was the excessive related party transaction. The second factor, of course, was the question of raising money in a high interest manner mm -hmm. with a high interest product. We spoke about that a few minutes ago before the cameras started rolling, we spoke about the executive flexible premium annuity, which was a, a, a mechanism the company had to raise funds. And then taking that money that you'd raised at high interest rate, and then investing that money in high risk things. Mm -hmm. So in fact, you have a, you have a pairing of, of, of risk and, and load that could, that could, if things turn a little wrong, pull a company into very dangerous waters. And some of those are the things that took place. Mm -hmm in the CL financial situation. The, the fact I'm trying to say is that we don't know when things went wrong and why they went wrong. And I'll tell you why. Because it's very important for us to grasp. I know that the people listening to this show tonight, those of you in Eastern Caribbean, your brothers and sisters, there'd be a feeling of pain and there'd be a feeling of loss because a lot of people's investments and pensions and their future and their family insurance and their business insurance is at risk. But we need to be patient, and we need to do the work to understand how those things came to be at risk. And I would like you to bear with me, listeners. Let us do a little chronological look at this question. Mm -hmm. What went wrong, which is what Mr. George is asking me, and when did it go wrong? Let's talk about that. 
the last accounts CL Financial published were published the, as, as at the end of December 2007. And those accounts disclosed a total asset value, which is at page 22 of the document mm -hmm. in your hand, mm -hmm. a total asset value of $100.666 billion TT. One, just over $100 billion Trinidadian dollars was the value of all of the assets of CL Financial as at the end of December 07. Mm -hmm. Important to note that it took 10 months and 18 days to publish those accounts. Those accounts weren't published by, by CL Financial until the 18th of November 2008. On the 6th of November 2008, the group finance director of CL Financial, Mr. Michael Caballo, he just, he, tomorrow is his last day at the job, he, he resigned recently, but Mr. Caballo gave an interview to the Business Guardian in which Mr. Caballo said, among other things, that the group was in excellent health. The, name, the interview, purpose of the interview is to find out how Trinidad and Tobago's larger companies are dealing with the global financial storm. And Mr. Caballo said the group was in good health. And because they had $100 billion in assets, they could weather any storm. He said that on the 6th of November 08. Bear with me. On the 18th of November 08, they published these accounts, which, which, which substantiated the statement as the $100 billion. Now, on the 13th of January 2009, 56 days after the accounts were published, Mr. Lawrence Dupree writes to Mr. Ewart Williams, who's the governor of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, and he writes to seek urgent financial assistance. And in his letter, in his letter, Mr. Dupree states an asset value for the group of $23.9 billion. Where did $76 billion go? You see, this is the depth so of the you, So you're saying that we had 100, or uh -huh. 100. Well, we and thought we had 100, yeah. But by the time we're in trouble, mm -hmm. so suddenly 76 has evaporated. That's a nice word, evaporated. That's good. That's legal. Evaporated. Yeah, good. The hot country, we live in the Caribbean, evaporated. But I have it here. I published it in The Guardian on the 19th of, of November, 2009. Mm -hmm. And the Minister of Finance read Mr. Dupree's letter into the record of our parliament in Trinidad and Tobago. That document is called the Hansard, and it's available at ttparliament.org. Of, of the 4th of February, 2009. The Minister of Finance read Dupree's letter into the record for the specific purpose. She says, with your leave, I would like to read into the record of Hansard a letter from Clico Investment Bank addressed to the Central Bank. That letter is dated January 13th. It's on the letterhead of CL Financial and addressed to Ewart Williams, who is the governor of our Central Bank. So we are faced here to come back to Mr. George's First question, very solid question. We are faced here, people, with an absolute mystery. We have accounts audited as at the end of December 2007 by Pricewaterhouse Limited at $100 billion. We have Mr. Caballo on the 6th of November saying $100 billion. We have the accounts being published on the 18th of November, $100 billion. 56 days later, $23.9 billion. That is something else. It's a case for Colombo. <laughs> and we need to find out where our money went, because it's our money. Yeah. And this is, this is the context of the show. Yeah. We're not inquiring into these people's private business. This has now become, because of what has happened, Tax this cares. has now become an absolutely public affair. Mm -hmm. And a lot of financial future in the Caribbean is tied into this question. Mm -hmm. So it's an absolutely valid, and I want to thank you for putting on this show. It's, it's, it's extremely worthwhile. Raymond, well, thank you so much again for agreeing. But th there's another bit of information that kind of baffles. Sure. That once the letter went to the governor of the mm -hmm. central bank, yes. that we are in difficulty, yes. help SOS. Following that, dividends were paid oh, a yes, huge amounts. Absolutely. This is another interesting point you're raising, and in fact, it's, it's, it's a very hurtful point, because as, 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 as Mr. George is saying, three days after the letter went to the governor of the central bank seeking urgent financial assistance, that date was the 13th of January 2009. On the 16th of January 2009, the group, that is the CL Financial Group, the same one that was in so much financial trouble there to write to the governor of the central bank, that group pays dividends to its shareholders. The group only has 325 shareholders, and I would like listeners to keep that figure in your mind. Only 325 shareholders are in the register as owning this entire group. Oh, no, and, and, we will come to, and we will come to what are the consequences of that small number, 325, during the program. Mm -hmm. But in fact, yes, dividends were paid. And my question has to be, is that legal? I'm not a lawyer. 
I don't pretend to be a lawyer, but as far as I know, you cannot, dividends are paid out of <laughs> profits, <laughs> and profits are arrived at after you've completed a year's business, and you have paid your bills, and what is left over is conventionally business people. We all know this. That's called a profit. You pay tax out of that, and what is left over, you could share up. Mm -hmm. I don't know that you could pay dividends to yourself, and your, and your partners, and your shareholders, and so on. If you, if you are unable to meet your substantial obligations, which is why they have to write to the governor of the central bank. So there's, there's obviously a huge question mark hanging over the entire affair. And indeed, that, that's, that's also an important aspect of it. Mm -hmm. you know? But somewhere along the line, we have to ask another very important question. Where were the people who were responsible for the financial system of mm -hmm. the region? Mm -hmm. The regulators? Because one of the things that has come true is that the statutory fund into which insurance should put money yes. when they are setting up, yes. that too was not funded. Well, yes, this, this came through in a shocking way. But I'll deal with the thing generally and thematically, mm -hmm. and I'll come to the statutory fund as a specific aspect of the, non, as the, as the, of the improper or inadequate governance of, the, of mm -hmm. the group. There's a phrase which, which we learn in economics and, and we carry it around with us, and that phrase says that sometimes something is too big to fail. And that brings us face to face with the classic notion of moral hazard. Moral hazard being the philosophical notion that actions and choices have consequences. And for a society, or for a group of people in a society, to grow in a proper direction, those consequences have to be tangible. Mm -hmm. And from the time you start removing consequences from a situation, people can do anything and as we say in Trinidad and Tobago, get a bly or get forgiveness. Okay, you can do anything because it will be okay on Monday morning. And once you remove consequence layer by layer from a situation, you start undermining the social code that pushes people to make more of the proper choices rather than and less of the improper choices. Mm -hmm. The point being here that there's a stage nonetheless, despite the philosophical background, there's a stage nonetheless in these small countries of ours including Trinidad and Tobago, we're a small country too. But there's a stage in things when a company can get so big that it can't fail. And in fact, it can become so big that the rest of the system fails, which is what you're touching on. Yeah. And you're touching on the fact that a lot of the organs that ought to have carried out proper governance and monitoring of the company perhaps were not functioning at full health. And it brings us to the metaphor, the African metaphor I used in one of my columns about the elephant. It's a bit of a joke and it's a bit of a riddle, but it's indispensable to understand the question. And the joke is, where does an elephant sit? And the answer is, anywhere it wants, silly, because it is so big that when an elephant is going to sit, the most I could do is turn to you and scream, George, the elephant going to sit, run! And we just have to run out of the way because it can sit wherever it wants. And this is what we are experiencing and what has led us to be in the studio today. Mm -hmm. And, and, and um, having looked at this summary of the situation, mm -hmm. I want you now to, to link because the viewers to this program are people mostly in the Eastern Caribbean. Sure. Tell us the link between what has happened mm -hmm. and how it has tied in uh, my viewers. Okay. Let us, I, I'll get there in two steps. Hold on here. I'll okay. get there in two steps. Let's, let's, let's talk to that issue when we return. Okay. And this evening, you are listening to Mr. Afron Raymond right here in Trinidad and Tobago, and he's trying to bring us up to date as to exactly what happened with CL Financial, British American, and your money. Don't go away. We'll be right back in just a moment. Welcome back to this edition of Up Next. I'm Jerry George, your host, and with me, Afro Raymond here in Trinidad and Tobago. What caused the big fallout at CL Financial that has left you wondering about your future? Afro is helping us on this edition. Yes, Afro. So when we went out, mm -hmm. um, we were trying to figure out how this links back yes. to my viewers. Well, I think that one of the things people need to understand is that it seems that the company, CL Financial, used... Clico and British American as organs to raise money. And that money that was raised was used to conduct a pattern of investments and alarmingly outside 
of the Caribbean. And of course, there's widespread speculation about exactly what the money was invested in. But in relation to the Eastern Caribbean question, which I know is of great concern to the viewers, the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union issued a press release on the 2nd of November 2009, which declared publicly the insolvency of the British, British American Insurance Company, which is an important subsidiary of CL Financial. And uh, that press release gave some shocking details. And one of them, I, I don't have a copy of it with me, but I do remember the numbers. One of the figures was, for instance, that if the group were to go into liquidation, if they were to sell all the assets and attempt to take that money and use those monies gathered from the sale of the assets to meet the liabilities, they would only be able to get 10 cents in dollar. That was a factual thing. Yes. It's not my opinion. Prime Minister Gonsal Eastern said that. Caribbean yeah. Currency Union said so. 10 mm -hmm. cents on the dollar. So in fact, 90, 9 out of 10 cents that was invested in, in that British American group has gone somewhere because it's not there. That's the first hard fact. The second hard fact, the degree of the insolvency, because the insolvency was also measured as a financial figure, as a single figure, the degree of the insolvency, from what I could recall, was 775 million yeah. EC dollars, a colossal amount of money by anybody's standards. For small, for small yeah, even Trinidad and Tobago, they're supposedly wealthy, it's a colossal amount of money to go missing from what is fundamentally people who are really poorer people. Yeah. Within the Caribbean context, the people in the Eastern Caribbean are not as wealthy, and it, was, it, it, it really is staggering. Mm -hmm. And the third thing that comes out, I'm just dealing with the hard figures, the third thing that comes out of the um, Eastern Caribbean Currency Union report is that a total of 301 million EC dollars was taken out of British American funds and invested in real estate, not in the Eastern Caribbean. You know, it's mostly more? to be in Florida. You know what's more? Is that I found out between th mm -hmm. that transaction yes. between them yes. only left the companies in the Eastern Caribbean with an IOU. Mm -hmm. with no proper documents. <laughs> no proper documents. Yeah. So we have, a, we have a really staggering series of facts with which to start this discussion on Eastern Caribbean implications. And of course, one of the things that, that, that is striking and the point was made by Norman Govan, Professor Norman Govan, a mm -hmm. Jamaican scholar who is now based in Trinidad and Tobago at his website, Norman Govan Oblique Info. Norman gave an extensive commentary on the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union situation. And one of, these, one of the striking points Norman made was that it's interesting what a peculiar creature British American is from the point of view of governance. Governance is a word we hear a lot about these days. <laughs> 20 years ago, the word was empowerment. Now we hear a lot about governance. And good governance. And good governance. And Norman made a very striking point, and his point was this. He said, here is a company that is headquartered, I think it's in the Bahamas. Bahamas. Mm -hmm. In terms of its legal headquartered, what, what lawyers would call its domicile. It was headquartered in the Bahamas, registered their offices in the Bahamas. The actual physical offices of British American are in Trinidad and Tobago. The, the, where all the chief people sit. The actual physical offices are here in Trinidad and Tobago. And then th on the third hand, so that the first hand is, is domiciled somewhere legally. On the second hand, physically, it's here in Trinidad and Tobago. And on the third hand, most of its business is conducted in the Eastern Caribbean because they don't have much of a presence in Trinidad and Tobago. Their presence in Trinidad and Tobago is relatively low profile yeah. compared to the presence that Clico has in Trinidad and Tobago. Almost hardly anybody has British American policies and so on. They've had a, a few offices, but it's no big thing. Mm -hmm. The offices here run things in the Eastern Caribbean. So it's, according to Norman Govan, the challenge for us in discussing this question is how really would you be able to regulate a company like that? Could someone sitting in an office in the Bahamas regulate something that took place in an office in Barataria or an office in Grenada? And going further, it, it, it points to the need to have a regional system and for us to start setting the groundwork but can for that. But CARICOM has a draft regulated policy that mm -hmm. sits somewhere yes. in the offices in CARICOM. It, Nothing it, has been done about it. Apparently it was approved about two years ago but remains unimplemented. But we need to have a regional policy for good governance of these institutions, particularly the financial ones, because as we've seen in this episode, the con and of course it's the Stanford story that I'm not going to mm -hmm. go into, but as you've seen in this episode, the consequences of poor governance can, can be enormous and run on for a number of years. 
another person who's been writing about it, just for the benefit of, of listeners and viewers and so on, another person who's been writing about it is Sir Ron Sanders, mm -hmm. who has an, a website also, sirronsanders.com, where he's been writing extensively about the need for good governance and a regional framework of governance mm -hmm. to help us to go to the next level and, and help our institutions to survive and our savings to survive. So those are some initial mm -hmm. But in, in when, when Prime Minister Gonsalves spoke um, in Grenada on the same release mm -hmm. and to give a, 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 situa a mm -hmm. situational analysis of where everything was, he used a, a term that I thought was interesting. He called it a Ponzi scheme hmm. that was carried on by British America. Well, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be saying anything like that because, I mean, as I as we say, you don't have any courtroom clothes. I don't know anything about that. What is clear is that, is that investors' monies were raised from the insurance companies, British American and uh, Clico, and to a lesser extent, Clico Investment Bank, and those investment, those funds that were raised were then deployed to do other investments that the people in charge of the CL Financial Group wanted to make. What is questionable, mm -hmm. and I will, I will, um, I will. Also, oh, there is. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it though. What is questionable, <laughs> and I, and I will say is that we did not have, and it's quite clear that it didn't exist. They, they did not exist satisfactory framework in terms of ex in terms of investment guidelines for the group. So in fact, it was possible for someone to do what it is we just outlined with British American funds in the Eastern Caribbean, 301 million EC dollars to be taken out of British American funds and, and sent into other territories to do other investments. And in, in, in a real world, let us go back to the start of the discussion. We spoke about loans which take place on an arm's length basis. And those loans on an arm's length basis, in other words, in the real world, the real commercial world, there are certain characteristics that are real loan mm -hmm. exhibits. And uh, in the related party world, it's, it's like a science fiction movie, there are other characteristics that they exhibit. And in a real world loan of that kind of amount of money, you would be able to see that someone had sat down and worked out how was, we going back to the scenario where A lends money to B, how is B going to repay that loan? Do you if think this B is was applying to a bank, B would have to be able to demonstrate how they were going to repay yeah, the loan, and so on and so on. But apparently those safeguards and those, those, those things were not there. And this is what the governor was re referring to when he said excessive related party transactions. Do you think this was, this was carefully orchestrated? Because the more I think about how everything is, hmm. it's as if somebody sat down and figured all the pieces, all the moves out, Mm -hmm. and decided at some point they were going to bail out. Bail out? Well, leave, leave the citizens, the ordinary citizens, yes. to pay the bill. I think that it's possible. I, I don't know. I'm not, mm, and none of us I'm know, not, but we need to expect, you know. I am writing, and, and what I've written so far, Mr. George, and the, the trend in which I do my work, I work for the published record. I, I really wouldn't know who was orchestrating what carefully. There are some things that are mighty peculiar, like the example I gave when I started up with that chronology. Mm -hmm. Another point I would mention to you, because we're speaking about the impact, and, and at the conclusion of the last section, you mentioned about the statutory fund. Mm -hmm. And I want to just return to that briefly. Because one of the first things the government did in Trinidad and Tobago, when they took, when they took a hand to bail out the CL Financial Group, was that they appointed a new board and a new level of senior executive at Clico. Clico, of course, is the company that most people naturally refer to the group by. They say mm -hmm. the Clico situation or the mm -hmm. Clico problem because Clico is a company is like a household name. Everybody in Trinidad and Tobago knows someone who works at Clico, and it, 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 everyone had a friend who had a policy, and so on. It's a huge company. And they appointed a new series of executives there. The new executive, the new CEO at Clico, the gentleman called Mr. Claude Mosebali. Claude, Claude is a former CEO, CEO of Clico and uh, had left the group and is now returned as an appointee of the PNM government. This is in Trinidad and Tobago. And Claude gave an, a, a statement to the staff of Clico on Wednesday, the 1st of March last year. Wednesday, the 1st of March, for those of you who may not know, was actually Ash Wednesday. And uh, he met the staff on the morning of Ash Wednesday and said that five billion dollars, billion with a B, like B for big, five billion dollars is missing 
from this sanitary fund of people. He went on to say, we don't know where it is. But hold on, the sanitary fund is held by whom? Afro? I don't know. I but it shouldn't be. Yeah, but, but isn't, shouldn't the statutory fund also be, be something that the government manages? I think so. But Mr. Moseb Ali said that $5 billion is missing from the Clico statutory fund. He said the people who were here before took it, and we don't know where it is. But, there must, that. but my understanding of a statutory fund, mm -hmm. it is something that the government also must have control over. Well, I, as far as I know, that's what it means. I'm just saying that's what he, um, that's what he, he said. That brings me to another, another, sure. another situation, Afra. Yes. It, it is amazing me, mm -hmm. right, that something of this proportion could be happening and there is almost an agreed code of silence uh -huh. on two fronts. Yes. On one front, by some of the people who are involved. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people feel ashamed that they invested and this has happened to them, so yes. it, they would hope that it gets fixed and nobody knows that they were there. But on the other side of the coin, you have people who should be speaking out on this issue. Mm -hmm. For example, what happened to the auditor's report? Could we accept in the, in the region that auditors gave their word to this and this happened? Mm -hmm. What happened to accountants? Maybe what happened to people like the University of the West Indies? You see, as I said in my last discussion on this, this sort of, this sort of point you're making shows us very soberly, and we have to be sober about this moment. Huh? We are a developing part of the world. We are all black countries. Let us be very sober about this. We have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to do better because terrible things happen in our past. We have a responsibility mm -hmm. to do better. We cannot shitty shally and do nonsense. We don't have those opportunities. We have to be the best of the best. And what's happening here is that it has, it's very painful. It makes you stop and wonder what was the point of 50 years of public education. We have never had more lawyers in the Caribbean. We've never had more chartered accountants. We've never had more people qualified in finance, more finance MBAs, more actuaries, more qualified bankers. Here we have the biggest conglomerate ever in the Caribbean. Collapses in the circumstances we've been discussing. And the, the quantity and the quality of discussion that is taking place is quite simply frightening. It makes you wonder what was the point of all of that public education? Let's take what a break. What was the point of 50 years of education? Thank Let's take you. a break on this no at this problem. point. This is up next, and we have some very sobering thoughts and very, some very sobering information. But you need to know, because if you have invested in British America or American or Clico, you would want to know what exactly happened and how to ensure it doesn't happen again. We'll be right back for more with Afra in just a moment. Welcome back to this edition of Up Next. When we went out to the last segment, Afro was asking the question, has 50 years of the best education ever in our ex existence been failing us? But I want to come to an article published recently, and again, it's, this is by Afro himself, actually, where it's ca captioned, the governor speaks, and the governor of the Trinidad Central Bank said these words. He said that what has happened here with CL Financial is a monumental failure of governance, that the board of directors failed to implement their controls. This, I think, is a very good point to come back in uh, for. Mm -hmm. Explain what that really means and its import. Well, as I said in the last segment, what we're dealing with is the reality, as the central bank has been reporting to us bit by bit, that the group sort of fell on its own sword. Let's discuss that for a second. Let's, we're going to discuss it in broad terms and then come into a particular uh -huh. example. The, one of the essential rules of finance is that we are striving to achieve the correct balance in between risk and reward. You have money to invest. One person offers 3%, the other person offers 6%, the third person offers 9%. Where do you invest your money? How do you, maybe you don't put it all with one person. You share it up. Uh -huh. What is the way in which you share it up? to safeguard yourself and also to ensure you get a reasonable rate of return. 
those are the sorts of things that people who study finance would be acquainted with. Mm -hmm. As well as to whom do you lend and at what interest rate? Prospects that are riskier, you lend it to them at a higher interest rate. Therefore, success in finance is predicated upon being able to interpret and put the correct balance between risk and reward. Mm -hmm. But in, it, it's interesting that one of the central ironies in the CL financial collapse is that a group that marketed itself as being able to handle your risks and to understand risk better than you, the ordinary investor. So they said, listen to you, give us $1,000 a month and we will ensure you a safe retirement. Because we understand risk, we understand reward, we are global. We have the qualified people, we have the experience, we have the global reach, and we will give you back a reward for having taken a chance with us. That is the risk and reward paradigm that the entire CL Financial Click or British American marketing platform was built on. But the central irony is that the mismatch between risk and reward is what brought the group onto the rocks. Mm -hmm. And they, 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 they proved in the, in the final analysis, as we say, ultimately not to understand the balance between risk and reward. And this is what Governor Williams was referring to in that, in that speech he gave at a conference on the 10th of November last year. In fact, on regional risk. Interestingly enough, the, the conference, mm -hmm. the title in the article, the conference was on regional risk. Mm -hmm. Okay? And we have a group where there were no rules, it does not appear, in terms of how much money could be taken out to invest in any one project. A prudent series of investment guidelines would contain ceilings, you wouldn't be able to invest any more than a certain percent of the money in a particular type of investment. Neither would you be able to invest more than a particular sum of money in a single investment, and so on and so on. But isn't that the function, ultimately, of the government in terms of putting regulators in place? For example, um, has Mr. Um, the Governor Central Bank, Williams, Mr. Williams, Williams, Williams yes. has Mr. Williams so acknowledged his own bank's failure? Well, it, it's interesting because I think he has. To answer the question simply, yes, I think he has. Mm -hmm. it, and it's interesting reading because if we go back to the beginning, and, uh, and, and the beginning is always a difficult point to trace. I mean, when did they all this begin? But if we just, for convenience's sake, go back to the 30th of January last year, and we look at that date and what Mr. Williams, Governor Williams said on that date, it's available on the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago's website. And it's interesting, very interesting indeed. It's the sort of thing that would make any thinking Caribbean person pause. And his subsequent statements are, to me, just as a piece of reading, exhibit a sort of, I would have to say, it exhibits, it speaks to a sort of tortured consciousness because the man repeatedly says, five years ago, there were signs that this thing was going wrong. Right. Six years ago, we called them into this husband. And he goes into this in public, and this public stuff, huh? And, and seven years ago, I met the man and asked him to give me this, and it's, it's all there. And uh, at one level, one could be political, and you could be cynical, and you could say, well, in fact, they should have done something, and why didn't they do something, and so on. And yes, there's they are grounds for making that kind of statement, yes? Mm -hmm. But at another level, we are actually seeing someone having to maneuver through a terrific catastrophe, probably the worst one he's faced in his career, the worst one we've all faced. Oh, anybody has we've all faced, yeah. okay? And realizing that, you know, five years ago, maybe we should have been harder. Perhaps some of that is, 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 is escaping in mm -hmm. the course of speaking about it. Uh, it it's really is... Uh, a striking moment. As I said at the end of the last session, we have to pause and ask ourselves where are the auditors in this? I'm coming to that. Where are the intellectuals? Because the auditors this? have given Clico mm -hmm. all these years yes. a clean bill mm -hmm. of health. Yes. 
how can we've we've all looked on from a distance at mm -hmm. Enron and mm -hmm. and all yes. of these other companies, yes. right? And saw what happened to a company like um, like Arthur Anderson, yes. which had to completely reband itself. Mm -hmm. And we in the Caribbean have companies that operate in the Caribbean, auditors I'm speaking yes. of, and we're allowing them to do this to us? And they're quiet and nobody's holding them culpable? Well, that is an important point, and to, and to put and to bring the thing to a focused point, swiftly to a single focus point. My key demand in this respect mm -hmm. is that I want to see the audited accounts signed by the CL Financial Auditor, which was Pricewaterhouse Coopers, as of the 31st of December 2008. And I'm saying to viewers tonight, whether those viewers on St. Vincent and Grenadines TV or those are subsequent viewers through my website, I'm saying to you, keep your eye on the ball. That is where the ball is. Let us refresh our memories. On the 6th of November, 08, Kambayo says, we have 100 billion, we can withstand any storm. On the 18th of November, 2008, Dupree issues the, the, the annual report signed by Pricewaterhouse, showing 100 billion in the balance sheet. 56 days later, on the 13th of January, 09, he writes to ask for money showing 23.9 billion. And I believe if we are able to nail people's feet to the floor and say, what was the figure as of the 31st of December 2008? Put your signature to that. I think we're going to have a very, very interesting story. Point about the role of auditors as, 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 a, as a responsible professional group in this entire financial crisis is an extremely important one. And I think that I would fix that in readers, in, in listeners, minds by getting back to the hard dates and the hard figures. The accounts at the end of 07, audited by PricewaterhouseCoopers, showed an asset value of in excess of $100 billion. Mr. Michael Caballo, the Group Finance Director, speaking on the 6th of November 2008 to the Business Guardian, said, we have $100 billion in assets. We can weather any storm. The CL Financial Group published its annual report for 2007 on the 18th of November 2008, showing in the published audited accounts $100 billion of assets. A mere 56 days later, Mr. Lawrence Dupree, the executive chairman of the company, writes to the governor of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, 13th of January 2009, to say we need urgent financial assistance and according to the Minister of Finance that letter was accompanied by a table listing the assets and showing a total of 23.9 billion dollars 76 billion dollars to use your word Mr. George evaporated just so and what we need to ask ourselves is okay well what was the audited account saying at the end of December 08 but I have read somewhere where they're saying that since this has happened, they have called in auditors, some forensic... Yes, they have called in some firms. The yeah. governor of the... Uh, Mr. Yes. Williams said that he will keep us informed mm -hmm. as this progressed. Mm -hmm. A year has passed, mm -hmm. and we have no clue mm -hmm. as to what is happening with the accounts. Well, that is very, very true and very, very disturbing. I think it was in today's Trinidad Guardian, the editorial, we in to the question mm -hmm. very seriously and asking for a probe into the CL Financial Group. And that's an important point. On the 13th of February last year, 2009, the governor of the central bank kept a press conference in which he promised that we'd have regular updates for the media on the progress of the bailout and to keep the public informed about this most important matter. And that hasn't really been the case. We have to now look at the move made by the government mm -hmm. of the Eastern Caribbean, mm -hmm. where rather than liquidating the company, mm -hmm. as we said earlier, 10 cents to the dollar, yes. they are now attempting to reestablish a, re yes. a new company. They're trying to keep to get it kind of the wheels turning, yeah, that's correct. What's your view on that? I think that's a very difficult task. I mean, I'm not an insurance expert. I think it's a difficult task because we have uh, two, two really big issues. 
one of them, well, there's three issues really, yeah? and they intersect. One issue, just moving, moving in order, one issue is that the world economy is on a slowdown. There's a serious slowdown, some say recession, taking place in, in, in the global economy. Number two is the region, including Trinidad and Tobago, which is the wealthiest country, the region is experiencing. We, have, we too are eating a slice of that slowdown too. And in the, in the Eastern Caribbean, it's a particularly bitter slice because there's a greater dependence on tourism mm -hmm. and remittances than in Trinidad and Tobago. So it, it has hit those economies particularly hard. So the capacity of the government, in other words, how much money does the government in, in, in these Eastern Caribbean countries really have right now to put into an exercise like that? And then the third issue is the whole question of confidence. Let's take a break right there because we're going to come back on we're going to come back on that issue of confidence and how important it, it, it is and how really and truly ca can we really fix this problem? That's the big thing. On this edition of Up Next, we'll be back for remaining moments with Afro Raymond, a columnist with the Trinidad Guardian newspaper, and the person who's kept his eye on this story from since January 30th, 2009. We'll be right back in just a moment. Up next, our remaining moments with Afra Raymond as we look at one year following the collapse of CL Financials. We went out just now talking about the importance of confidence in a new company proposed by the governments of the Eastern Caribbean. Confidence, Afra. Yes, well, the, the, real, the real question is those, as I outlined a little while ago, those three issues intersecting, the global economic slowdown, the regional economic consequences of that global economic slowdown. And lastly, the consequences in terms of commercial confidence coming out of the collapse. Mm -hmm. So you had insurance with one of the companies in the group. It may have been Clico, it may have been British American. You had investments, you had your pension, friends had pension, mm -hmm. family had investments, members of the family had insured their businesses with it. And the thing got in a problem, and people saw a lot of difficulty to get their money. And we are fast forwarding a year from now. So there's this new company here, which is the one you're we're giving a lot about. of hope by saying it's, it's, it's a year from now because not even the governments have given us a time frame on yeah. when this company is. I'm just saying, let's say a year from now there's right. a new company, which is the one that they were speaking about setting up. Right. And this new company has some of the same people that were working in the old company. And the way things happen in the Caribbean, let us be very frank. We live in small societies, and we have our difficulties. Every society has its difficulties and its blind spots. And, and one of our difficulties and our blind spots is that when we speak of crime and our security, our personal security, we are often speaking about violent crime. So we speak about murder, and robbery and burglary and rape and these kidnapping terrible things, and kidnapping stuff. and so on and so on. But in fact, within the Caribbean, the way the Caribbean is run, white collar crime is almost never discussed. When, when does somebody in a jacket and tie go to jail? When does somebody who went to college or fancy university ever go to prison? I mean, for a good amount of time, seven years, 11 years, 19 years, it doesn't happen down here. It's something you see on cable TV. That is something that happened in Canada or England or America. The point I'm making, is that given our track record so far of not punishing legally, not punishing legally or financially people who have been involved in financial wrongdoing and allowing white collar criminals to get away, there is a shaky amount of confidence in the atmosphere generally in the Caribbean. The Clico thing has been an immense disappointment. And again, let me speak frankly. I ended up one of the segments speaking to this concern. Let's talk about it frankly now. The way the Caribbean has emerged, the way our society has grown, there have been very limited examples at the absolute top level of black tycoons. Let us be frank. Mm -hmm. It hasn't happened. Okay? It's beyond the scope of this program to get into why it hasn't happened. But that's the fact. Africans are very seldom represented at the top table in terms of business and commercial success in the Caribbean. 
And in that sense, Lawrence Dupree and the Clico group, they were an exception to the rule. They were an exception to the rule that for many of us was welcome. People were happy to see somebody who looked like them, let us talk plainly, mm -hmm. at the very highest level of things, running things as we say in the Caribbean. And as a result of that pleasure at seeing one of your own, as we say, the old people say one hand can't clap. So yes, they got a lot of criticism and there's a certain sort of colonialism in some people's mind that they don't want to see somebody looking at them get too far ahead of the game. But also they got a lot of support because people wanted to see how far they could go and so on. There's a lot of support. And that fire of hope and optimism and so on that was one of the winds blowing in Clico and CL Financial sales to keep them going to these unprecedented lengths. That fire has, to a large extent, been snuffed out. There's a lot of disappointment yeah. over what has taken place. Disappointment is me being polite. A lot of disappointment. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is a huge factor you have to make up to build confidence for people to put their insurance and their investments into this new company where some of those same people who were in the old company are probably still working. And the ones who were at a level to have perhaps been involved in wrongdoing or bad decisions, poor decisions, don't pay any penalty. And I'll make a, a little point to close out this section, Mr. George, which is that under the Companies Act in Trinidad and Tobago, which is a 1995 act that governs the responsibilities of directors of companies, mm -hmm. you talked about this question earlier, the, the responsibilities of directors have now been expanded. So, so the wrongdoing, the things that are, that are demarcated as wrongdoing, used to be limited to things like fraud and dishonesty and so on. And in fact, the definition of wrongdoing has now been expanded to include mismanagement, which is what makes the statements by Governor Williams so very potent. But is anything going to be done about it? We you know, it's know. like in the Caribbean, we, we part, have laws. We are part of the conversation. Right. We, we have laws, but they never seem to be implemented. And, and another thing I need to say is that a lot of people rush to become directors of, of boards mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. forth. I think without understanding the full import of what they're doing and what they're mm -hmm. letting themselves in. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to speak to that issue too. Yeah, well, directors have a liability in law. I'm, I'm not an attorney. I'm a director of several companies. But directors have a liability in law to act prudently and to manage the company competently and to their best of their ability to safeguard the interests of shareholders. Okay, you have to be mindful of the interests of stakeholders, you know, safeguard their interests. You, you do safeguard the interests of your shareholders and in fact to obey the law. Those are the principal responsibilities of company directors. And uh, we, we can get into a situation where something is so huge that it can outweigh all of the other pieces that are on the board. And we mm -hmm. talked about that earlier on, mm -hmm. about something being too big to fail. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the point I made was that something could be so big, I would reverse the saying, something could be so big that in fact everything around it fails. fails. And, and that, that is what we see here. It's like, it's like one of those astronomical things where mm -hmm. a huge star goes to an area and everything gets distorted in the area, the light, the sound, everything gets distorted because it has such a gravitational pull. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're seeing, the influence of a colossus. You know, those are the main responsibilities of directors. But, but you, you, you're in this program yes. all the way through, I'm, I'm sure mm -hmm. with a great deal of interest, are persons who have been burnt. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, a lot of them are quiet because maybe they feel ashamed. Is there anything yes. to be ashamed of in this? There's a certain amount of there's a certain amount of shame and blame in the atmosphere, and I'll tell you why. Let me be straightforward with viewers here so we don't we understand each other. Mm -hmm. I have never supported the bailout. Let's be really clear. I have never supported any bailout of the CL financial group or any group for that matter. And I'll tell you why. For years, there was a situation in which if you had $100,000 to invest and you put that $100,000 in Scotiabank, it used to be 3.5%, 4%. 
if you put it in Royal Bank, it was 3.5%. And Clico was somehow able, month after month after month, to offer investors two times the rate. It was roughly two times the rate mm -hmm. of a normal bank account. Now, we all know that there's a relationship between risk and reward. And if you are getting a bigger rate of interest, it means that what the company that is giving you that interest is investing that money in is riskier. We all know that. People made choices, and people chose to invest their monies in the higher but, but interest stop. instrument. Sure. Could you stop? Because sure. I, I, I have heard that argument, mm -hmm. and in fact, I interviewed the governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central sure. Bank, and he made that point. Mm -hmm. But we have to understand, maybe not Trinidad, but in St. Vincent and Grenada, our people are as not as well educated when it comes to financial issues. So really, they trusted the system. Yes. They thought that there were people, including the government, who were watching out for them. Yes. Yes, I understand you. I understand you. There's, there's a point at which people place their faith in the system and the system by allowing certain companies to remain licensed exactly. in, in the case of Clico and, and, and CL Financial may have assisted mm -hmm. in the extent of the losses and they may have felt that it is incumbent on them to step in and pay off investors. But, but two questions arise, huh? two questions arise, I'll tell you what the two questions are. The first question is, and those questions go beyond my objection. To the, to the bailout in principle. Mm -hmm. The first question is this, and we touched on it in the last stanza, is there enough money to do that? Do we actually have enough money on the table to do what we've promised to do? To do. Because even in Trinidad and Tobago, which is, which, is, which is relatively a wealthy country, probably the wealthiest country in the region, the question is now being asked, I certainly have been asking it, is, are there enough resources? for the government of Trinidad and Tobago to match its, its, its commitment. And, it, and there, there, are, there are troubling signs of people who cannot get their money. Yeah. People who have to wait inordinately long, long times to get their money. And it so does it rich Trinidad and Tobago. Right? Yes. So that the first question is really a very practical, and forget my philosophical difference of opinion. The first question is practical. OK, I could see why the government did it, and that's why they agreed to bail it out. But question A, can they afford Everything. to do that? And, and question B, the reason, let's, let's go back to the reason, without getting too deep in philosophy, the reason for them doing that is because they, they accept, which is, which is your point, and, and with your interview with Dwight Venner, they accept a degree of responsibility for perhaps not having governed the system as they should have in the interest of citizens and taxpayers. Mm -hmm. But what about if, and it's not a big stretch, we get an Antigua-type lawsuit? Because there was a group of investors in Antigua sorry, in, in domicile in the States, who had invested with the Stanford Bank, which is domicile in Antigua. And those people have taken a lawsuit in Houston against the government of Antigua, suing them and threatening them with a lawsuit because they are accusing them in a lawsuit of having been corrupted and having not governed as they should have, therefore leading to the loss of their investment dollars. The case is to be tried in an American court. If they win, they will literally bankrupt the state of Antigua and Barbuda. It's, uh, I can give you the links for that. That's a whole fascinating story. But the question Which arises... Which Arabia is present time has problems. Yeah, but, uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, but, the present, but the question arises, are we in other parts of the Caribbean, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, or Trinidad and Tobago, for instance, also exposed to similar lawsuits? Because one of the features of the CL financial empire is that it was international. So they were actually taking deposits and borrowing money and so on all over the world. But we went to the so, U.S. So someone anywhere could sue. But we went to the U.S. to, to, um, to claim back some of our money. The, the judicial managers yes, took that. Yes, I saw that, yes. Right? Yes. So, so you're right. So it has expanded it's the over borders, it's cross borders. Across borders. Mm -hmm. But what about, that's the other thing I've wondered. How come a group of Caribbean nationals have not come together to sue Sale Financial? Well, that is the reason that the bailout was, I think, was put together to... To stop that? To, st to go back to the Dwight Venner question, the governments accept a level of responsibility. But that doesn't stop and anything. They don't, want, they don't want that happening. But if they're not able to find the money, people may be motivated to still sit around the table and go down that road. So in fact, it, 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 will, it, it may all fall 
on that practical question of whether there's enough money in the pot, as opposed to falling on any of my philosophical differences about what I would have done or what you would have done. Mm -hmm. They've done it. It's happened. And sure, it's happened. And uh, they, they, it's very slow in getting your payments. So a lot of frustration is but, building. But think of it, right? There's a person who, who's sitting tonight watching this program mm -hmm. with a great deal of interest. That person has done all the things right in their lives. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. They have worked, they have saved, they have invested. That person has just gone into retirement. But by and large, there's no money for them to retire now. Mm -hmm. How does that person treat with life? Mm -hmm. But still, the company is still asking that person to continue their payments, mm -hmm. even without knowing where they're leading. Mm -hmm. that, that, that question was raised at a meeting I attended at Clico's conference room on St. Vincent Street in, I think it was in March. The company asked a number of us, it might have been April, the company asked a number of us, the new management asked a number of us, in other words, we were companies in Trinidad and Tobago that had investments with them. My company, the company which I run, Raymond and Pair Limited, we used to have our pensions and our health plan with Clico. We stopped our pensions about five years ago. We had a difference with them, and we stopped it. Mm -hmm. But we still have our, our, our staff and myself and so on as insured through the health plan. So we had an interest. So they wrote us and asked us to come to the meeting. And I attended. It was a huge meeting. Um, the Mose, Mr. Mose Bali was in charge of the meeting. He's the new CEO and the top executives and so on. And there was a lot of upset. And I can remember the very first person who spoke at that meeting was a woman who runs a family company. And she got up and said, you know, since all this happened in January, and uh, there have been so many different statements that have contradicted each other. And none of it feels very good. But I've just stopped paying my premium. She said, I haven't paid premium in four months. And I don't like what I'm seeing. And when I, when I, when I see that it looks straightforward, I will start to pay my premium again. She, 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 she caused an uproar in the meeting. <laughs> she said, I'm not paying any more money. You know? Well, Raymond, mm -hmm. <laughs> I said Raymond, Afro. Mm -hmm. Let me thank you very much for this, and I'm sure that this will not be the first or last time that we'll chat on this it's my topic. My pleasure. And it thank is you. an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. You have a good so, day. Speaking with Mr. Afra Raymond in Port of Spain, on location in Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago, where one year ago, 30th of January, the CL Financial Group fell apart. You have listened, you have heard, you need to do something about your situation. I'm Jerry George. Thank you for viewing this edition of Up Next and join us when next this program airs. And whatever you do this week, be outstanding. So long.